Good evening. I think we're ready to start. Uh, my name is Kai Bird. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. And I want to tell you a little bit about the Biography Center. We've been going for almost 11 years, almost 12 years now, and we've funded 44 fellowships, which have now produced almost 20 published biographies, with many more on their way. And we also award uh, four fellowships every year at $72,000 a pop. Our current biography fellows are Rebecca Donner, who's working on a biography of Mildred Harnack, the only American executed by the Nazi regime in 1942 or 43. Stephen Heyman for a biography of Louis Bromfield. Jennifer Holmans for a biography of George Balanchine, and Samantha Subramanian for a biography of the British scientist J.B.S. Haldane. Um, I also want to take this moment to draw everyone's attention to the fact that we recently established a fifth fellowship, this one devoted to biographies of figures in science. Funded by the Alfred Sloan Foundation, this fellowship has a deadline just around the corner, March 1st but it's not too, too late to apply. Also, I'm very pleased that we are now hosting a brand new two-year master's degree program in biography and memoir. This is the first graduate program anywhere in the country devoted to studying the art and craft of life writing. If you or your friends are interested in writing a family memoir or tackling a full-fledged biography, please keep this program in mind. Applicants are now being accepted for the fall of 2019, and merit scholarships are available. And I believe we have some leaflets passing, being passed around <clears throat> to provide more information about this. But speaking of memoir, tonight we are here for a very special conversation between Bridgette Davis, the author of The World According to Fanny Davis, My Mother's Life and the D Detroit Numbers, and Farah Jasmine Griffin, the William B. Ransford Professor of English and African American Studies at Columbia University. Uh, she is also the director-elect of the Institute for Research in African Studies at Columbia University, and Professor Griffin's new book is Who Set You Flowing? The African American Migration Narrative. I want to emphasize that we have books for sale, courtesy of Books on Call NYC, Please get your credit cards out and ready at the end of this event. Davis, Bridgette Davis is a professor of journalism at Baruch College, part of the CUNY system. She started her career as a reporter, where all good writers learn to write. <laughs> Writing for Newsday, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Detroit Free Press, and many other publications. She has since published two very well-received novels, but I'm very pleased to see that she has now discovered the merit of memoir writing. <laughs> I am myself a devoted biographer, but I once also took a detour into memoir, and I can say that memoir is very different and very close to the bone. My childhood memoir also partly dealt with my mother's life, and when I was writing it, she was still with us. So I recall sending her a chapter at one point during the process, and she responded by commenting, no, that story is all wrong. And I replied, but mom, I wrote that anecdote citing your own letter from the very time in which the incident took place. And she snapped, well, the letter is wrong. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> Such are the perils of memoir, and particularly when dealing with the family. Anyway, on that note, I want to turn the conversation over to Professor Griffin. She will interrogate the author. <laughs> and then we will have 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you. <laughs> I have to, um, it won't, it's, interrogate isn't quite the word, it's like a love fest <laughs> after reading this remarkable book. Um, but I thought I would ask you to read a little bit because it would be oh. great for folks to hear your voice. And I'd love to, thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you all for being here. I'm going to read from the prologue, so there's no need for a setup. Just a few pages in. <sighs> On a morning like most, I sit beside Mama at the dining room table, eating my bowl of sugar-frosted flakes and watching her work. She's on the telephone, its receiver in the crook of her neck as she records her customers' three-digit bets in a spiral notebook, repeating each one. The crystal chandelier blazes above. 442 for a quarter, 693 straight for 50 cents. Is this both races, Miss Queenie? Detroit and Pontiac? Okay. 388 straight for a quarter, uh huh. 475 straight for 50 cents. 110, box for a dollar. Mama writes the numbers 110, draws a box around them, hesitates. You know, I got customers been playing 110 all week. Yeah, it's a fancy number. Oh, did you? What did you dream? He was a hunchback? Huh, is that what the Red Devil Dream Books say it play for? Now that I didn't know. I know theater plays for 110. Well, I can take it for a dollar, but since it's a fancy, I can't take it for more than that. You understand. What else, Miss Queenie? 684 for 50 cents box, uh-huh. 972 straight for a dollar. I find comfort in Mama's voice, in the familiar rhythmic recitation of numbers. I bring the bowl to my lips and drink the last of the sweetened milk before I rise and kiss Mama's forehead. She mouths bye-bye as I join my sister Rita, who's waiting on the porch. Together, we walk three long blocks to Winterhalter Elementary and Junior High School, passing by the lush Russell Woods Park. I am a first grader. In class, I wait in line to show my teacher, Miss Miller, my assignment. We have had to color paper petals, cut them out, and paste them onto a picture of a flower. I like mine, as I have glued each one just at the base so that the petals now reach out into a pop-up flower. Miss Miller looks over my work, gives it one star, instead of two, and stops me before I can return to my seat. You sure do have a lot of shoes, she says. Last week, she asked what my father did for a living. And because I knew never to disclose the family business, I said, he doesn't work. She asked, well, what does your mother do? I froze. I'm not sure I lied. I knew my mother was in the numbers, but I also knew not to tell that to anyone. I worried that my vague answer was the wrong one, but I didn't know a better response. No one had told me yet what I should say. Now, with Miss Miller staring at me, I looked down at my feet, which are clad in, I still remember, light blue patent leather slip-ons with lace-trimmed buckles, a favorite pair bought to match a brocade ensemble that I have just worn for Easter. I nod, not knowing what else to do. Before you sit down, I want you to name every pair of shoes you have, she insists. Go ahead. There is no lightness in her voice. Anxious, I go through a mental inventory of the shoes that line the built-in rack in my bedroom closet. I manage to recall 10 pairs in various colors and styles. The black and white polka dotted ones with the bow tie, the buckled ruby red ones, the salmon pink lace-ups. 10 pairs is an awful lot, says Miss Miller. Her blue eyes fix on me with something I cannot name, but which I would now call disdain, and she orders me to take my seat. I can feel my classmates staring at me as I return to my table. Is it wrong to have so many pairs of shoes? Did my mother get them in a bad way? The next day in class, Miss Miller calls me back to her desk. I can smell the hairspray in her teased blonde bouffant. 
You didn't mention you had white shoes, she snaps. Indeed, I'm wearing a white version of the same pair I wore the previous day. I feel as though I have been caught in a lie, and I know that I've disappointed my teacher. I worry that I'll get in trouble at school or worse, at home. I'm sorry, I whisper. Miss Miller shakes her head in disgust and dismisses me with a wave of her hand. I return to my desk, trying hard not to look down at my shoes. I am ashamed of them. That evening, I tell Mama what happened, but I wait until after she's finished taking her customers' bets and before the day's winning numbers come out. I have already learned that the best time to tell Mama difficult news, something that could get you in trouble, is during that brief, expectant pause in the day. That's when Mama's least distracted and still in a good mood. She listens, and when I confess I forgot to tell Miss Miller about the 11th pair of shoes, her dark eyes flash with anger. I fear a spanking. That's none of her damn business, she says. Who does she think she is? Before I can feel relief that she's not mad at me, Mama says, get your coat and let's go. I do as I'm told. Mama throws on her soft blue leather coat, the color of the periwinkle crayon in my Crayola box, and together we slide into her new Buick Riviera. Are we headed back to school to confront Miss Miller? Thank God, no. As Mama heads south, away from Winterhalter Elementary, she soon turns onto Second Avenue, drives to the corner of Lothrop, and parks in front of the new center building. There sits Saks Fifth Avenue. We enter through regal double doors, and I instantly fall in love with the store's marble floors, brass elevators, and bright chandeliers. I feel lucky just being here. Mama takes my hand and leads me to the children's shoe department, where an array of options spreads before us. She points to a pair of yellow patent leather shoes. Those are pretty, she says. Perhaps the saleswoman looks at us askance, given how rare it must have been to see black people inside Detroit's upscale shops in the 60s, but I don't remember. What I do remember is how nonchalantly Mama opens her wallet, pulls out a $100 bill, and pays for the shoes, while the saleswoman looks at her the way Miss Miller looked at me. When we get home, Mama says, you're going to wear these to school tomorrow. And you better tell that damn teacher of yours that you actually have a dozen pair of shoes. You hear me? The next day, I wear my brand new shoes with a matching yellow knit dress. Nervous, as I walk up to my teacher's desk, I announce, Miss Miller, I have 12 pairs of shoes. She looks down at my feet and then levels those blue eyes at my face. Sit down. Miss Miller never says another word to me. I feel her rejection, but I am also relieved. I no longer have to worry about what I wear to school or feel bad about my nice things. I feel both protected and indulged by Mama. Growing up, that's how it was for me and my three older sisters and my brother. We lived well, thanks to Mama and her numbers, which inured us from judgment. My mother's message to black and white folks alike was clear. It's nobody's business what I do for my children, nor how I manage to do it. Nobody's here. I was telling Bridget that I, I was reading this book um, and it got to the point where I wouldn't read it on public transportation because I didn't know if I would laugh out loud or start crying or, doing, or I'd do both. So I'm um, having one of those moments now. It's a remarkable book and your mother is a um, figure that we 
aren't used to seeing in the pages of novels, nonfiction, fiction. So I was wondering if you could start by telling us a little bit about your journey to writing this book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how did you, how did you yeah. get there? Yeah, I've carried the secret around forever um, because it was the most natural thing to not tell. I have a friend that uh, has been my best friend since we were fourth grade in the fourth grade, and she spent lots of time in my house. And when I finally sat down to interview her for this book and told her, she was like devastated. What? She had no idea. And that made me realize, wow, we really did keep that secret. <laughs> we were pretty good at it. But uh, what really happened is that I would wanted to write in my whole life, and I just never had the nerve. And even after my mom died, I didn't really have a reason, per se, to keep the secret, but I still just couldn't tell. Just couldn't. I felt like I was betraying her, so I just didn't do it. And then one day, about 10 years ago, my son was, he was about nine, and he looked at a photo of my mom that I kept on the, night, on the uh, side table, a picture of her at her high school prom, beautiful photo. And he just looked at it and he said, Mom, what was she like? And I stumbled out a response. I said, oh, she was amazing, but my heart sank. It just sank because I realized I had kept that secret so well. I had kept who she was a secret from her own grandchildren. And I just decided at that point, enough is enough. And I started this journey mm -hmm. to, to really get the story told. What did you have to, because when you read the book, you get um, Fanny Davis's story, you get Bridget's story, you get, um, you also get the story of that generation of people who migrated to Detroit and made a life in Detroit. Detroit is a character, very vivid character here. So what did you have to to work with, like what, what was your material? There was your mother's life, but yeah. to really flesh that out, what did you have to do? You know, I think that I've been preparing to write this book my entire life because I write novels in a similar kind of way where it's almost collage-like. I'm pulling all these different elements into the story. I love history and I love adding um, historical elements even to fiction. So when I got to this, I did one thing first, and then I knew the rest would come easily. I went to my mom's remaining sister, my Aunt Florence, who just, uh, she just loved the ground my mother walked on, you know? She just told me recently how much she misses her. I mean, it was something uh, for me to think about doing this without her blessing, I couldn't. So I went to her and I said to her, Aunt Florence, I'm really thinking about writing this book about my mom and I'm gonna tell everything about her life and the numbers, what do you think? And I didn't know what she would say. I knew if she didn't approve, I wouldn't do it. And she looked at me and she said, honey, I'll help you tell it. <laughs> because what Fanny did was unheard of and people ought to know. And that was the first time I realized how proud everyone was of her achievement and it made me understand there's a secret that has nothing to do with your pride over that person that they're not, to, they're not related. And I had conflated them in my head. And in fact, her thing was, no, it's amazing. Tell everybody, I'll help you. And that sent me on my way. I did two dozen interviews. Wow. And I had my mom's big brass trunk that I had inherited. She had a lot of things in there. I just, whatever I found, I thought this is part of the narrative and I'm going to try to weave it in. And then I did my own, yeah, I did my own history. I was, uh, I mean, I did my own research. I was asked about having a source list in the book and my editor was saying, you know, it's not that typical for a memoir. I said, well, the journalist in me really wants that source list. She said, okay, put it together. And I did and I was stunned. I was stunned and I wrote the book. I had a hundred sources. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there they are. I didn't know I was doing all that, but everything I found led me to something else because you can live a life but that doesn't mean you understand the context around what's happening in that in your life at the time that um, you know it takes place. So I, I have to tell you, it was my own curiosity 
that led me down all those paths. Well, one of the things that you do, I mean, and, and you know, as an academic, I'm like, oh, wow, there is a value to the work that scholars do beyond oh, yes. just for, you know, the 10 of us who read it. Oh, please, um, I thank you know, So scholars. it was really wonderful seeing what you do with so much of the sort of secondary sources. But the other thing that you do that this book demands, and you do it so well, um, is in order for us to appreciate what your mom accomplishes, you have to explain the context. Like you have, you know, you, you, you couldn't assume right. that everybody reading it understood the numbers or even the people who grew up. I grew up in a family that played numbers, you know, all, all the time. But I didn't, I didn't, I never understood how they really worked, yeah. you know. And so was that knowledge that you always had? Was uh -huh. that something that yeah. you had to, I mean, and it's not didactic at all. It, yeah. You know, it's like, it's like a mystery. It's like, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah it's funny because the other thing my Aunt Florence said to me when I got her permission was, she said, I know that Fanny didn't make you learn anything about the numbers, so I'll help you with that too, because I know you don't really know. <laughs> She was, I was like, Phew. because, you know, I lived around it, but I didn't really understand the intricacies of it. Yeah. And so I really did lean on her help. And I also was grateful that there was research out there, specifically a lot more around the numbers in Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, there's an incredible seminal book called Playing the Numbers. And it's about the numbers in Harlem during the interwar years. And so that gave me a lot of research, a lot of understanding mm -hmm. of its history. Mm -hmm. But I was learning that too. Wow. That's why I'm, I was like, wow. I was, act, I was literally like that when I was discovering things. Yeah. Well, yeah. after you give it to, I mean, after you sort of give us the complexities, I mean, I think for me as a reader, it just made me appreciate even more your mother's accomplishments and like her brilliance and her creativity. Yeah. So can you just talk a little bit, because I think most people are familiar with the legal state-run numbers. Yeah. Um, how someone like your mother confronts that challenge when the state decides they're going to go into the business of the daily numbers. Like one, what that challenge is to her business right, right. and then how she confronts it. Yeah, you know, it is true. A lot of people, especially younger people, think that the lottery was always there because it's always been in their lives. But the, the lottery, legal lotteries, are really a recent phenomenon, so to speak, because it was not until the 60s that they became re-legalized. They had a history of being legal uh, as far back as the 19th century. Um, so Detroit, Michigan decided finally that they would legalize the lottery. Everyone knew that the, there was this underground lottery business that was being run by blacks. Uh, and when they legalized it first, it was just like a weekly lottery. It was not in competition with the numbers. The numbers were every day, six days a week. People took that seriously. They played daily. Um, and so no one worried about it that much. But then they got around to their real goal, which was to be in direct competition. So they created something called the daily. And it was literally whole cloth a ripoff, down to the slogans. Would you dream last night? You can play it. I mean, this is running in the Detroit Free Press, like a full page ad. You know, it was so stunningly, um, like, you know, s such, a, such theft, really. I'd say that they usurped yeah. the business. Um, and my mom was concerned because people, she worried that her loyal customers would finally, you know, say, well, it's legal, I'll just play that. Uh, even though there were some benefits to playing with her. She, you, you didn't have to pay taxes <laughs> if you won, but also she let people play on credit, and she let people p play for as small as, as small amount as they wanted, and those were things that the state didn't do. But then the, sna the state did have an advantage. Every evening on the local news station, they would announce the winners of the numbers, the three-digit winners, and you can't compete with that. People loved being able to just see the winners um, at one time, all together, without any complication. And the numbers were a little more complex right. Right. when you had to sort of wait to hear what the, the winners were. And I don't know, she just decided that if you can't beat them, join them. Mm -hmm. And she got this idea that she would use the state lottery's numbers as the winners for her own underground business. <laughs> and 
it worked. People love that. It worked. She's, I mean, she's, she's just brilliant. And, yeah. and she's also, I think, one of the things that you talk about, both specifically to her, but then in terms of the history of the numbers and the, the people who run the numbers, the, the black bankers, and is the level of, um, with your mother, it's just almost extreme generosity. Yeah. Um, and then philanthropy, and I think that that was something, like, you know, I, I, it, it made her so kind of well-rounded, like the generosity to everybody. Yeah. And then the history, the sort of philanthropic history of the people who are making money off of the numbers was something that I had never yeah. known about. Yeah, people didn't realize that. I mean, my mom was very generous, it was just her nature, but also she was, following in a tradition. That's what numbers runners, big numbers men, and in her case, one of the only women mm -hmm. doing this, that's what they did with their largesse. Their understanding was they were race men and race women, and they were pillars of the community. So they helped to provide all those services that um, weren't available to blacks, thanks to discrimination, racism, segregation. They were doing things like providing a hotel for black entertainers to stay in because they couldn't come to Detroit, for instance, and stay in a downtown hotel. It wasn't allowed. They provided uh, home loans because blacks could not get loans. The FHA would not insure loans that were for homes where any black person lived. So if you were a black person <laughs> trying to buy a home, you couldn't get it insured by the FHA. That's the federal government that was ensuring that blacks didn't get that most basic opportunity to uh, have a foothold in this country and buy a home um, through a home loan from a bank. So numbers men often provided those resources. I mean, the, the, the examples are just so many. Right. And, and one more that I love is that the NAACP, particularly in Detroit, was fledgling back in the day. And it was a numbers man who came in and infused it with resources, propped it up, and made sure it was viable. So when the civil rights movement came along and Detroit was a hotbed of civil activism, they had those organizations uh, available to them largely thanks to the resources of numbers men. Yeah. So, you know, the history that you, or, you know, and, it, and it's sort of the historical context and then your mother's own navigating of it, right? The, the stuff about housing and buying property and all of those things. It's just um, fascinating how you weave all of that together. Um, one question that I had um, is, did you ever have a sense of her artistic ambition? Was there any, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, my mom was unique. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, of course. Um, but also because she wasn't just any one thing. I mean, she was a great mom. She took great pride in being a mother. Like, that meant a lot to her. She was also a businesswoman and very proud of her business, too. And she was a good friend, proud of that, proud of being a philanthropist. All those things meant a lot to her. Helping young women meant a lot to her. Also, for as long as I can remember, my mom was writing her a story, which she ultimately called a Romana Clef. But she would call it her book for years. She wrote it longhand in a black binder on unlined paper in different colors of ink. And she did this when she had free time, which was almost never. But when she could get a chance to go on a vacation, she'd take her book with her. And I never knew what was in it, but I knew she was writing this book based on some story she had heard growing up in Nashville. Um, and so that meant, it's funny, I took it for granted, it was just this thing she did, but now I know she was really, more than anything, I felt like I was getting permission to be a writer. Yeah. Right? right. Definitely. And it's sure enough, in my early 20s, my first efforts in short stories, I put them in a binder, <laughs> and I was writing them longhand. Yeah. Um, but one of my greatest joys is that I was able to take that story, which I still have. It sits on my bookshelf in my office. I was able to take that story and take excerpts of it and put it in this book, which felt to me like an opportunity to finally get her a chance to be published. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. beautiful. I mean, it's beautifully narrated. And she's a good writer, right? She's a great, yeah. I she's mean, a great she's, storyteller. She's very yeah, good writer. that was what it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what were, and you talk about this a little bit. I mean, you do, not a little bit, you, you do it quite a bit, actually. What were the difficulties for you, um, if any, growing up as the indulged baby girl of a woman who was involved in this line of work? Were there tensions? Were there difficulties? I didn't experience uh, difficulty in the sense that her life was something I had to contend with or that the secret was difficult. It wasn't hard to keep. It was so my normal. It was all I knew. By the time I was born into the family, it was just what we did. So I never struggled with keeping that secret. Mm -hmm. That wasn't an issue. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest stress was just seeing her stressed and knowing we all knew that if she got a big enough hit, well, would she be able to pay it? Would she be busted out, as they say? And what would that mean for our lives? So that was always un sort of humming underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there I was, you know, sort of not wanting for anything. The day I told her I want to go to Spelman College, she didn't blink an eye. So I just thought, things are good. And when I look back, really what was happening was, despite the tension, despite the sort of underlying knowledge of what could happen, it never did. My mom always figured it out. Yeah. And so that was something I just, I just got very comfortable assuming what always happened. I've been following you on Instagram. Oh, really? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, she's here, she's there, <laughs> she's everywhere. Um, as you go around talking about the book, and one of the things that I, you know, each time I see you somewhere, I wonder what the reception is, has been like for you in the different places that you've Unbelievable. gone. Unbelievable. So it's been incredible. I, I've, I've been a few places at this point. I just kind of started the tour. So I went to Philadelphia. I went to Washington, DC. Um, and, and I could see there was interest. There was always someone who would stand up and share their story about someone they knew in their family who had been in, who'd been in the numbers. But it was after I, I went to Detroit. And I just got back on Tuesday. And I was there five days. And it blew my mind. It really did. Not only was it like, you know, hometown girl makes good, <laughs> and I'd show up at these events and there'd be people from every phase of my life. There was always someone, I did three different events there, and there was always someone who stood up to tell the audience what my mom had done for him or her. Yeah, everywhere I went. Wow. That was so moving. It was so moving. And I'll tell this other anecdote because it's so sweet to me, and then I will really answer your question. But um, I have a line in the book where I say that my neighborhood in Detroit, uh, in fact, my own blo my block where I grew up, was integrated for a few years before white flight really set in, and that my first playmate was a little white girl named Susie, who lived next door to me. And I just say I really I remember Susie. And I remember my mom saying, that little girl didn't care anything about color. And it seemed like for a while her parents didn't either. Well, I did a reading at the Detroit Public Library, and who showed up? <laughs> Susie! <laughs> she drove all the way from Kalamazoo, Michigan, a little distance. Wow. And um, she had just read the book. And when she saw that line, she was like, that's me. That's me and showed up to, this, to, to my event, you know, with, with a gift of these Petoskey stones, that's like Michigan's <laughs> official stone. And I mean, it was the whole thing, because we used to play together in a little sandbox, which she reminded me of. It was something. I just thought, how beautiful, anyway. Um, but what's really mostly happening when, in Detroit and everywhere else, I figured it out finally. People were so grateful, are so grateful, to be able to finally give voice to this knowledge. I'm not the only one. So many people had this experience in their lives, one way or another, and they've been keeping it quiet. And finally, they can say, thank you. That was what I kept hearing. Thank you for giving voice to this. And then I saw the love that people have around the people in their own lives who did this, and, their, and the respect they have. I mean, the, 
At one point, this older man got choked up, telling me how grateful he was. Because what was he doing? Remembering the people in his life who'd worked really hard and made these choices to try to give him a better life. I, I feel like that's what's happening. That's what it's tapping into. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I am, was grateful to see was, um, and you, you, you know, you're very explicit about this, is a portrayal of a working class black community um, where people have, you know, aspirations and goals and drive and fun and love and I mean, I think it's one of the one of the most vibrant portraits of a work working class black people. Um, the music, the, you know, all of those things. Uh, I, I was trying to think, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know much fiction, nonfiction that gives us that version of black life. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you for mm -hmm. saying that. You know, we write the books we want to read, I think. Yeah. And I, I knew, back to Spellman, I was the odd woman out, I knew that. I had come from an urban environment. I came from a public school. I came from working class parents who had not gone to college. I was not the norm, okay? Mm -hmm. And I could feel it. And yet, there was no shame in it. I just thought, why, is, why am I you, one of the only ones? Because, you know, those of us out there who have my particular background are hidden from public view. That's the problem. And I felt it even then, and I've been carrying this around a long time. I sort of coined this phrase, blue collar, black bourgeoisie. <laughs> that's what we were. Yeah. And so that's some of it, you know, just wanting to, to make us visible. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah. that's what it felt like. I was like, oh, they're my people. <laughs> yeah. Know, there we are. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to open it up. But before I open it up, I have one last question for you. You are a filmmaker. Yeah made a wonderful film um, that we screened many years yes, ago. Yes, she did. <laughs> and are you, like, are you thinking about that with this book? This book, to me, read like it was ready for the movies. <laughs> Your mother is like, I mean, she's glamorous, she's beautiful, she's generous, she's complicated, she's, you know, Detroit in the 60s is amazing. So are you thinking that way yet, or is that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly, I would love to see this as a film, TV show, film. Mm -hmm. um, I, I realized looking back that all that sort of screenwriting <laughs> experience like, came to bear also on the book because I think I was thinking very cinematically as I was writing it. Uh, and yes, there's been interest. That's, that's what I'll say. There's been interest, and I hope it turns into more. I hope so, I too. Do. I want to yeah. see. I want to yeah. see this. Keep, I want to read it, teach it, see it, all of those things. So. I have one more thing I want to share, yeah. and it's a little bit of a brag, but I just have to share it. Share it. I, I got an email from someone who, whom said he was an, ar he said he was an archivist for the Schlesinger? Yeah, the Schlesinger, yeah, Schlesinger. Uh -huh. up at Radcliffe. At Radcliffe, at Harvard. Um, the, it's for the history of women, mm -hmm. right? And he said to me, we really want your mom's papers. Wow. And I was like, papers? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And he said, no, I understand there are no real records from the numbers left at this point. But he's like, she's a lot of things. She was a lot of things. And anything that you can provide, we want that kind of history. Yeah. We want that to be part of what's available to people. And I was like, oh my god, Fanny. <laughs> Pretty awesome. And so that is exciting to me because I, I agree. I think that we need to begin to think much more broadly about who's valuable and whose story yeah. needs to be told. And so that, I don't know, that felt beautiful to me because it's taking it beyond my own memoir. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of the things that people say is, you know, we, we can't write these stories because we don't have the archive. Right. But there you go. There you right? go. There you I might go. need your so. help with that, though. Let's yeah. open it up for um, questions, comments. I have to say, um, I got a chill when you just said that because I was thinking, I was wondering if you had any of her books because I know that maybe they didn't keep records, but I remember the numbers man always having little slips of paper and all that sort of thing. You know, and people need to see that. Yeah. So do you have any memorabilia? Really, I have a, I found one little scratch paper where she'd written some numbers. Yeah, but I didn't keep those things, yeah. 
Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading Becoming, and I was going, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. People are going, wow, what a world she's showing us. And it's beautiful, but again, it's that same thing. It's like, yeah, that's millions of people mm -hmm. right. that somehow got missed in the yeah. discussion about who are black people. Right. You know? So I, I did. I saw a lot of similarities. Yeah. I, lo I ate that book up. It was just like so wonderful to see it in print. Yeah. Around the corner from me. Exactly. And don't you care? And I just want to say, I mean, as soon as I found out about the book, I ordered it, got it, read it in one sitting. Oh my God. <laughs> and when I got to, my mother and I were extremely close. When I got to the end of the book and mm. writing about the relationship, somebody said, don't I spoil. Was, I mean, me too. Me too. How did you get through writing that? Because I just, I mean, I just, it, and it's been, it's been 15 years since I wrote that. And yet, you wrote it in such a way. I could only, I could see her, I could see your mom, you know, the whole thing. It was, it was, it was so hard for us. Thank you. I have a feeling that one of the reasons I waited so long is because I knew I would have to write that chapter. And I just didn't want to. But what did I do? I, I did write it, and um, this really happened. I, my husband's sitting right there, and I read it. I asked him to read it, and I cried, and he held me, and he told me it would be all right. And then I sent it to my editor. <laughs> but it took all that. Yeah. Those of you who haven't read it, just be prepared. Don't don't read the end in Starbucks, right? <laughs> like I did. <laughs> like I did. But you know, when you were talking about the specifics of the place, that's because she does it so well, right? Like you know, we um we we know that first house and we know that street. So when you go back there and look at it, we feel the same thing you feel, because you know it's just the specifics of the place that are so heartfelt. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that was the other thing, was the presence of Motown and then the feeling of abandonment when they leave. Right. You're but, sad, <laughs> even though you knew it was happening. You know, you know what's going to happen. Diana Ross is around the corner, really. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Bridget, you touched on uh, speaking with your editor, and I was just wondering if you could share with us, when you first took this to your editor, can you share the conversation that you had and how their reaction was, and in terms of doing the publishing, perhaps this is a little different from what you've done in the past? That's a great question. Um, I feel fortunate that I found the right home for it. And you know, the way the publishing world is, is that you have an agent whose task it is to help match you with the right editor. And I was very lucky. She, everyone involved who helped me, helped me with this knew how important it was to me and how concerned I was initially about anyone thinking that they were getting a story they could exploit. Because look at the you know, outlines of the story, right? This woman does this illicit thing in Detroit in the 60s. You could, it could go south quickly. And so that was my concern all along. I need to make sure they understand what I won't be saying in this book and what I will. Um, and my editor, her name is Vanessa Mobley at Little Brown. The beauty of working with her it was not just that she's really smart and she understood um, what I was trying to do with the book. She understood my mother. She got her. And the way she talked about her, I knew that she would bring that kind of respect and admiration to the editing of the book. And so, yeah, this is my third book, but it's definitely my most, it's like just a match made in, hev in heaven. It really worked out. Yeah, so. Yes. Um, 
Um, you know, the, the beauty of this is that it's not a tell-all in the traditional sense. And even though there's a secret at the core of it, it's not a dark secret. And so there was no reason anyone would object to my telling this book. It was really a communal effort. Everyone, I feel like I have written a book for all of us in my family. I was the one really writing it, but writing it for all of us. And so that was always the attitude that everyone had. Like, let's just do this. Let's let the world know about Fanny. So I felt really supported in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, you should be doing that. I just want to thank you um, for your generosity in sharing the story of your mother. Uh, I can recall growing up in a home where numbers were a mystery. It was so, you know, just wondered what it was. And I lived in my grandfather's house. And thank you for ennobling what people do in the black community to survive in spite of the oppression. Uh, and even though it was something illegal, um, they made it what it was into something that was noble. Um, nobody thinks of all of the robber barons and what they did right. to amass all of their fortunes and nobody looks askance at them. So thank right. you for Fanny's story. Thank you. It's so many stories of us growing up in Bed-Stuy and knowing about the numbers. Thank you. So true, yeah. so true, so true. Yeah, I wanted to make it clear from the beginning that from where I sit, this is, it was always a legitimate business. It was legitimate. Yeah. It just happened to be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect line, yes. Hey, good evening. Thank you again. Thank you both. Um, and I also, um, I can, uh, I understand what the last commenter said because growing up uptown, I, um, after, I remember listening out of the, my window, um, there was a brownstone across the street, and um, every so often you hear this, like a little clinking of the, the clinking of the gate opening and closing. And after a while I was like, huh, what, the, what does that sound? And, um, but anyway, there was a, it was a numbers spot, like right there across the street. And um, so yeah, it was very, very, lot, lot, very active. But anyways, I was curious if you, um, I, was, I was looking, thinking about the title of your book, and, and I um, also um, hearing what you were saying about we write the books that we want to read. And um, I just, maybe just like how, what do you feel, what does it think to see or to sort of project this world from, from your mom, from a, a black, this, a, this particular black woman's perspective, and and in in light of the fact that they're like the fact that we all we have all these worlds that are in the say the store the 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 book of the the many books the many books the many worlds that we exist in and so what does it mean for these like worlds to kind of exist side by side and. Um, I don't know. I know it's not not so clear, but I just think it's so interesting that, like for example, like on a block per se, we have all these families and these different you know different family sections and these different stories happening. And I mean, I guess yeah. So I don't, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. There's a question. Yeah, but <laughs> but that's okay. It's it's um, fine. Yeah. Sorry. No. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I like her. I mean, I think we we're always smudging the, the demarcations, you know, are not so clear. Folks do what they got to do mm -hmm. to make it and to survive and to provide. And 
There, we are often straddling different worlds and classes. So it's really, um, it's too simplistic, right? To just say, oh, those are working class folks and those are upper middle class. I mean, this culture is fascinated with upper middle class blacks and poor blacks. Right. That's, That's the thing that this culture is really fascinated by, interestingly enough. Now, when everyone wanted to know about the working class in this country, because, yes. oh, right, the election. They weren't thinking about us, though. It that? was interesting that it was code language for white working class. Right. It was like there's a whole there's a whole world of black working class folks. That's the majority of black people in this country. Who was interviewing them? You know, so you're right. These labels are very, they're inaccurate, they're limiting, and they're, um, you know, they also ostracize those labels. So my attempt, you know, with this blue collar black bourgeoisie was sort of a, you know, a pun in a way, but it was also a way of saying to be black working class does not mean you don't have nice things or don't aspire to nice things and don't have aspirations in general. I mean, it's, it's like that was my effort to sort of come up with something. And yeah. one of the things that it helped me think about was, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, many people will think about their own families, not only black people, what was about how sometimes, you know, for the most part, you're black working class, but sometimes you're black working poor. Yeah. Right? And right. for my own family, like when we slipped into black working poor, sometimes what kept us from going lower were the people who were in the underground economy mm -hmm. who could, in the family, yep. right? Help you who out. Could help you out until right. you were able to get on your feet again. Right. And at all of that, I think you see in this book too. I do want to ask you you, you mentioned something when we were talking, and, and if there are more questions, we can take them and then wind up. But you mentioned something when we were talking about. Um, how what you are seeing is also at these events that it's not just black people who stand up and talk to you about their grandmother who wrote numbers or their, you know, that. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> um, one of the things that's really happening is that um, I'm getting emails through my website from all kinds of people uh, that have heard me on the radio or they've heard about the book or they read the book. And they're wanting to tell their stories about their lives in the numbers, <laughs> or their, their families' lives in the numbers. Let me tell you, I'm not kidding. I've gotten an email from someone who's from the Ukraine. <laughs> I've gotten you know, someone who's Jewish and wants to tell her family story. Someone Irish, Italian-American. I mean, it's pretty. And that's why I'm like, you know what? <laughs> the life of the numbers, that's the quintessential American story. People just haven't been talking about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, or the, the, the equivalent of something underground. Right. Some underground economy before folks were accepted as Americans, they did what they had to do to get that foothold. Hello, Joseph Kennedy Sr. Right. With your bootlegging. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, right. anyway, <laughs> oh. I digress. One, okay, we have two more questions and then we'll, yes. Yeah, yeah, my grandfather um, was actually an, uh, a businessman. He, he had his own plastering business, which is pretty extraordinary. He was born, you know, um, in, I forgot in the year, 1865? Yeah, is that right? No, that's when slavery, no. <laughs> <laughs> he was born in the late 1800s. And um, he, uh, but yeah, he basically had this thriving, this business that provided for him and, and his family and his nine children. And he could not wear a white shirt to work around his white um, employers because they didn't like what it implied. He bought a car for his, his boys, but he had to hide it. Why did he buy a car? Because his boys would sometimes be coming home in Nashville and they'd have to pass by a white high school and his concern was that one of those girls could cry rape. 
and then his boys would be in trouble. So he didn't want them walking around. He wanted them to have something they could drive to keep them safe. All those things you have to think about. Um, he had the means to do that, but then he had to hide it at times, or the, he had to use those means to just try to keep his kids safe. So yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> One last question. There was a hand back here. Hi. Hi. OK, so before I ask my question, I just want to say that your mother was both fabulous and fearless and more. And I think by today's standards, she would be, if you would permit me to say, a certified badass, basically. <laughs> my student, Ophelia. And, <laughs> um, my question is, um, what advice would you give to young writers or writers in general who want to write the truth you know, about themselves which would include their families, but you know, are crippled by the fear that they may expose someone or you know, tell an untruth about somebody, you know, mm -hmm. not to basically portray them in a bad light. That's a great question. I'm not sure I'm the best to answer it. Look how long it took me <laughs> to get up the nerve to tell this story. Um, you know, I, I was inside of the fictional world for a long time. And I think that there, there was a reason for that. I guess I would say that I believe your family's more important than anything that you would write because I do think you have to care about what they think and then make those tough choices. But I'm not that person who would say, just write it, it's okay. I don't think so. I think that um, that's a lot of power to put a, wor a story out in the world and it is worth going through that process with your loved ones and uh, sort of figuring out what, what you want, you feel like you can comfortably say. You know, I do think that's important. Sometimes your truth is so strong that you need to tell your truth no matter what. But know that that's a, a sacrifice you're making and make sure it's worth it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this beautiful book and for everything. It's wonderful.